Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah. So um, when uh, Venki had reached out to me about this event, I was a bit, you know, uh, confused that how should I exactly format this talk? Because um, you guys are essentially technologists and engineers. I used to be once, once upon a time in my life when I was doing my PhD, but then I pivoted to policy. So let us begin with what is policy? Policy is what the state does, period. All right. Now, you guys are FOSS people, so you have like a, like by definition, you are fundamentally averse to the state. The state has monopoly on coercion. You are all for freedom. But just because you can ignore the lion doesn't mean that the lion wants to ignore you, right? So we need to talk a little bit about policy in that sense. And particularly, I'm going to make a case today about AI. It might sound a little bit out there, but it is backed up with rigor and scholarly work, which I will not be showing, but uh, you should have patience till the end. And this is the case. The central claim of my talk is that machine learning systems are as much social systems as they are technical ones, and hence, trying to govern them instrumentally, that is, with data-driven methods, data-driven in scare quotes, that is what is called AI safety these days, is a grave error. I was earlier going to write the words, is at best delusional. But then I thought that uh, I shouldn't call most of you deluded. Um, this talk is a, like, I wrote a very angry newspaper opinion piece when the AI safety letter came out of the industry, which was essentially penned by the genius of our times, Elon Musk. But uh, it sort of made me think that perhaps I need to go and talk to the engineers, shake them by the shoulders and be like, please stop. And uh, why force? So there are two things here. First of all, I think you guys are more uh, like the, the formal definition of free software. I think you are propelled by more than that, by ideas of equity, which go beyond just is a software without license. And the second thing is that over the last decade, the volunteers of the free software community in India have often also been unwitting pawns to market and state forces. You have uh, public technologies being made, which are often made with volunteer effort and zeal, and they are extremely harmful, and they, are en uh, they end up being used by the state for incredibly coercive purposes, and AI is going down that route. So hence this talk that if you are, if you think that quality of artificial intelligence or uh, just to see whether it is not snake oil or fraudulent, whether you can just do it via technical methods, that is not going to work. That is what the argument is. So let us make the argument. So there are three ways in which currently AI safety is done. Debiasing, explainability, and there is a third one. And we'll go through all three and try to uh, make a case why these are misleading at best. We'll start with debiasing, which is the most researched one. Um, debiasing is right now taught in many AI courses. Like if you, uh, uh, if you go to IIT Bombay, where I come from, and if you take a high-end AI course, you would end up being taught debiasing. There are books on debiasing, et cetera, and it doesn't work. Uh, uh, none of it does work. Why? First of all, I do not want unbiased concentration camps. Some AI artifacts, I don't want them to work. I'm very happy with them being extremely biased and essentially trash because it, it, it would be a problem for me as a policy professional if these AI systems start working. So FRT is one of them. I don't want facial recognition tech to work. And thankfully, it doesn't work. FRT systems are 
ब्यूटिफुली अरोनस राइट दे आर बायस्ड इन सच वंडरफुल वेज एंड पीपल लाइक अस कैन देन गो अहेड एंड से दे आर बायस्ड हैंड्स डोंट यूज देम बट दैट्स नॉट वॉट वी मीन we mean that even if they were not biased don't use them but uh, that is a hard sell if the state and the market have conspired to make a product out of it then all you can say that oh it is biased so don't use them but you don't want unbiased concentration camps right and by the way this is not rhetorical some of the most cutting edge ai research today happens in literal concentration camps automated border crossing systems for example they use frt they use emotion tech and we will go into i have a lot to say about emotion tech but uh, you will see them in places like for example a place in news recently gaza the world's largest prison so if you ever cross into gaza you would be subjected to incredible amounts of ai experiments it's a garage of ai you will have silicon valley companies who know they cannot deploy their wear anywhere else in the world but they can do so in that area because uh, people don't live there so uh, or people in the sense of people with rights so uh, i don't want unbiased concentration camps there there is too much ai out there which it doesn't matter to me whether it is unbiased or not argument 2 once you start the discourse on bias once you have accepted the discourse on bias what you have said what you have capitulated to is that it is fine to use ai the ai system under discussion and you have moved on from bad to biased if you are saying an ai system is bad for some normative value of bad you are saying i don't want it but once you have said it's biased you have essentially given ground to accepting that if it were not biased i would theoretically be okay with it and for this to happen it doesn't need to be a concentration camp i'll give you some practical examples the indian supreme court in its wisdom is pushing ai systems in summarizing court cases in uh, recommendation engines to generate discovery for various uses all of them are bad all of them are bad because um, um machine learning is fundamentally something you should not be used uh, where uh, arbitrariness needs to be avoided because all machine learning systems are stochastic and are incapable of having moral agency but we are going to be using them in the courts there is a second order problem here that uh, supreme courts or states do not make these machine learning systems at the end of the day they would either be made by volunteers groups of volunteers or private companies i do not want to be ruled by volunteers groups of volunteers or private companies i i i don't even want to be ruled but if i have to be ruled i would rather be ruled by politicians <laughs> and not you guys right uh, let's let me let me be very clear about this you don't like really inspire confidence uh <laughs> engineers that is so when you say that you know don't use ai to uh, uh, do uh, recommendation systems in supreme court instead of saying that people are like oh these are biased against women or these are biased against dalits i don't care even if they were unbiased towards women i still don't want them third this is a major problem and this concerns engineers in many ways bias has become an optimization problem it is not but people treat it as so now in the textbooks on bias you have problems to solve where you are trying to uh, you know optimize against bias and reality doesn't work like that let us have a small example uh, gender bias right most gender bias happens because there is an epistemological problem there's a knowledge generation problem most gendered data sets exist because they were created by men and most data sets are created by men because most people who are at the controlling echelons of ai organizations are men it is a fundamental factor of how society works it has no, not much to do with the data set 
And now, if for those of you who do not know what that big word means, epistemology, it simply means how knowledge is produced. So, certain things are knowledge, certain things are opinion. Distinguishing between them is a job for philosophers, not for us. But there is a whole discipline out there which deals with how knowledge is produced. How, what we as a society consider knowledge, where it comes from. And that is the source of bias. If, for example, I were to train a large language model on common crawl, it is by definition going to be biased because human language, all of it, which common crawl reflects, comes from extant society and every single extant society is bigoted in certain ways. You may think that the solution is to then try to debias these data sets, but the actual solution is to have the humility to accept that this is a red herring and perhaps we should be very, very careful about where we should be deploying AI. Debiasing has almost become, you know, in the policy space, whenever we are talking about the state, I'm looking at the time as well because I have three arguments to make. In the policy space, you should always become a bit suspicious when companies start giving money to conferences which speak against their discipline. So as soon as you see everybody giving funds to workshops talking about bias, and these everybody are AI companies, that, that's not how reality operates, right? If you are seeing that something is happening. So bias has become a very nice distraction for a deeper question here. So let us take an example. We have taken three arguments, let us take an example. It's a practical example. Those of you who have flown into Bangalore may have experienced variants of it. It is called Digi Yatra. If you go through the airport now, there is a, a choice you have to take your face, to give your uh, identity to this facial recognition tech system. Now, what is interesting about Digi Yatra is that it is a use case. It is a, uh, it is a not just a use case, it's, it's the selling point of a paper which came out of Niti Ayo called Responsible AI. So the entire paper talks about responsible AI. It's like we should not use AI in sensitive places. We should not accumulate data. We should not uh, use AI in a manner that expands the uh, ambit of identity which is being stored. We should not use AI in uh, sensitive national and then finally, and we should have Digi Yatra, and well, you are going to collect everybody's faces, so you are essentially violating Potaswami. Uh, you are going to store it in a centralized manner. The entire project is actually not a government thing. It was started by some startup in Bangalore, just like you guys keep forming, it like <laughs> throw seeds, startup, and then the state suddenly finds its beatification and shines a light on it, and then it becomes a state project. Uh, this is called shooting and crying. Does anybody know what shooting and crying means? Anybody? Shooting and crying? So, uh, you know, when, again, that place on earth where a war is going on, I think we should talk about that war. So earlier, in that place, whenever soldiers of the country, I would not name, they would shoot a civilian, they would then cry about it. They would write books, how I feel so sad. I had to kill a civilian. They made me do it. These terrorists made me do it. I had to kill some civilians. I feel so bad. Half of policy literature in AI is shooting and crying, wherein uh, they would talk about responsible AI and then advocate irresponsible things. The very phrase responsible AI is a very sly phrase. It's not saying, it's not letting you ask the question whether or not that particular AI system should exist. It is saying deploy it responsibly, which means that the decision has been made to deploy it regardless of what an AI scientist thinks or regardless of what a policy scholar thinks. It will be deployed, deployed responsibly. IBM has a whole document, they have a whole department to measure the responsibility of certain AI systems. You have to 
there are a bunch of things and you tick mark against them, but nowhere in that document is it, should this AI system exist? That you can't question. You can talk about privacy protocols, you can talk about um, uh, anonymization, you can talk about all of that. None of that works, by the way, anonymization doesn't work. Uh, but at nowhere, like, should we deploy it, it might harm people, should we still deploy it, and that's not there. Argument four. This one, I think, is more familiar with room. Stochasticity cannot be engineered away. There is no machine learning system extant which will not give you positive and negative errors. That's just not possible. Fundamentally, all machine learning systems are probabilistic, they are stochastic, and hence, they are going to give you errors. At this point, generally, and I'm going to preempt that, somebody would say, but humans do error as well. If we are using AI systems in courts, well, humans are also biased, humans also do errors. Yes, humans do errors, then you can take them to the court, or you can uh, plead with them, or you can murder them. You can do many things with humans. You can, you can beg, borrow, steal with humans, you can threaten humans, you can vote against humans, you can declare war on humans. You cannot declare wars on algorithms. That's not a thing. And with ubiquitous algorithms controlling every aspect of, like, you are going through um, an airport gate, there is not a person inside, and it just keeps bleeping red because machine learning says you are not who you say you are, right? In 10 minutes, you will miss your flight. Simple example, right? Who, who would you talk to? All that stuff about human bureaucracy being incredibly inefficient and error prone, etc. At the end of the day, humans have moral agency. Opaqueness, um, the sp one of the speakers before did talk about it. Nowadays, it just so happens that most models are incredibly large and opaqueness is sort of baked into the system. So we can, however, choose not to use machine learning. If there is one thing I would like you to take away from today's talk, it is this idea of reification, or to make it easier, thingification. Thingification is something which is not real, becomes a thing because the entire structure, the entire world, puri kaina taka, it, it makes a thing out of it. One simple example is superstition, right? In earlier times, everybody believed that if Jupiter is in the seventh house, something will happen. You may say that is wrong. There is no reason, there is no sign. It doesn't matter. If the whole world believes Jupiter's seventh house, thing will happen. Similarly, people believed that your bones in your head, if you are circular, you are a greedy person. If your nose is flat like mine, you are an able leader. If your nose is sharp, you know, you are angry. If your head is conical, you are a Martian. Right, this was called physiognomy. Then Charles Darwin came and said, no, no, humans are, you are being deterministic, humans are not like this. Humans are capable of all kinds of things. So Charles Darwin said, don't look at their bones, look at their expression. If they smile, they are happy, if they are frowning, they are sad. Charles Darwin was also wrong. Just like your bones are not connected with your inner nature, your inner nature is not connected to your outer features. But today we have made a, tens of billions of dollar worth market out of this superstition, it is called emotion AI, right? The, the, the person who started the field, Rosalind Picard, she has 70,000 citations on Google Scholar. She's a fraud. I'm saying this publicly with full responsibility. Okay, effective AI is fraud. Emotion AI doesn't work. I am going to say it in every public platform I'm invited to. But it is now a thing, because all AI engineers have made it a thing. Reification. Things become real even if they are not real, and benchmarks are the reason, right? You, how many minutes are left? Huh? Five. Five. Okay, thank you. So, when you have created a benchmark, which is measuring for accuracy, but the measurement itself is wrong. Everybody who works in NLP, you would have heard of the blue metric, right? Blue metric. You would know that it doesn't work. 
like it is our our nlp old bug beer so my phd thesis was in nlp but then there are metrics and benchmarks which are worse till the point those benchmarks stop being in the realm of physical reality and step into the realm of fantasy but because the benchmark is the benchmark everybody has to get sota results on it which is the mcnamara fallacy mcnamara was the secretary of state of the united states when it was in the vietnam war and mcnamara famously said that whatever cannot be measured does not give you information and whatever cannot give you information should be ignored the beautiful result of this was usa lost the vietnam war the thing is that precision is not truth because a data doesn't cover all of the truth and b what your metric for is always an approximation of truth c your metric could be completely delulu <laughs> so dangers of chasing sota one problem with this is it also alters the field ai started out as a science and ended up becoming a engineering field simply because everybody started to chase benchmarks and then people stopped doing science which was tragic i blame gpus uh, and finally metrics are often aggregate and don't tell you much like uh, this every ai person knows that at the end of the day uh, your f1 score is kind of meaningless you have to do ablation things you sort of then need to go inside and look at what works so ah uh, final explainability the last of the three things benchmarks bias and explainability explainability doesn't exist machine learning systems cannot really explain why they gave a result what at best what they can do is give you a heat map and heat maps might be very useful for engineers who build those systems but they are not explanations and they are not definitely not explanations to people who use these systems on ground especially people with power people like police officers people like judges people whose wrong decisions can lead to loss of liberty of people which is what the force community cares about and also even the technical kind of explainability which is advertised doesn't exist yet this is what a state of the art explainable system looks like a computer vision system which tries to tell you via heat maps why it gave a why it gave a result it gave again perhaps very interesting to an ai engineer but this is not an explanation and if i am a judge and i am about to sentence somebody on basis of a machine learning model um i i don't care about this so the wicked problem of policy making around ai it at the end of the day actual existing ai is a political problem what ai should exist and what ai should not exist needs to be decided by society harm needs to be decided by society it cannot be a data driven measurement of sorts every effort on that would be in vain it would bark up the wrong tree because it it is measuring the wrong thing these are not technical artifacts these are artifacts whose data design and deployment all occur in the social sphere so if you are involved in technology especially if you are involved in ai technology please concern yourself with society please concern yourself with politics and please uh, start enrolling yourself into public policy courses Th uh, thank you that's all for me i know i took a little more time than what was <laughs> apologies yeah yeah sure if you guys want time right gentlemen there gentlemen there uh, i agree with uh, all the concerns you mentioned and yeah. uh, there is no question on those but with policy makers uh, and when there are nations competing with each other there is yes. a general anxiety of not adopting or not getting on the bus explore, ex exploring these things and i think uh, right now we do not have any counter to that okay this is a question which uh, many people have asked of me that is a cautionary principle co contrary to 
innovation and will it possibly lose you market share, things like that. At which point I think, and my honest answer is, and it's an unpopular answer, that I don't care. <laughs> that uh, my, uh, uh, my, my bias, I am also a model, I have a bias. My bias is towards the individual, towards the citizen, towards a person with their rights. I don't actually care about, uh, then it, we, we can do it later, right? You were asking? Can I? <coughs> yeah. Uh, uh, hi, sir. Hi. So I have been making dashboards for the government. Uh, so I've mostly I've been doing data-driven governance for that matter. But I'm also concerned now, uh, like obviously. Uh, so <laughs> what? Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to know, like, uh, what should, like, I think that will continue to go on. Like right. A lot of governments right, want right, to do right. data-driven right. yes. governance. And uh, there is an element of truth that they want to capture from data as well. Right. So how do I balance? OK. I don't think it is a spectrum that you go full on blind at AI adoption on one side and full Luddite, let's break all our computers on the other and do the Butlerian, you know, those of you who have read Dune, the novel. Uh, it's not a spectrum. Whatever you do with the, see, a lot of the things I say, I am able to say this with a certain degree of certitude because I also am an AI scientist. That's, I, I don't come from a law or a humanities background. I did a PhD and then I shifted to policy. I think that people who work in technology need to learn things they are not good at. They need to learn law, they need to learn the social sciences, and they definitely need to learn how the world works. And only then, like, because I can't solve your problem for you, na? you will make your dashboards for states, but to make certain they are not inadvertently causing harm, you need to know how people operate and how state operate. So th again, my primary thing is that a lot of these problems are not things which can be solved at a very surface level by throwing more technology at it. Uh, so, when it comes to any company, when they have a model, they'll obviously deploy it. There'll never yes. be a question of whether yes. we want to deploy it or not, if it works. Yes. And that's because there's a market failure. Yes. Because the market uh, forces force them to do that. Yes. So, do you, since there's a market failure, do you expect the state to, uh, uh, like, coercively take action there? Okay. Do you want that's, the state to that's get That's an interesting here? question. Uh, two things. Uh -huh. First, I do not think that the state is a unchanging and impartial entity which fl flies above all of us, right? The state has a class characteristic and the state changes according to who the state is favoring at that particular point. So if the state is such that it is undemocratic and is essentially subject to what in policy is called elite capture, then the state is not going to do anything. Now, how do you make certain the state is not prone to elite capture? That will require the vast majority of people who work in AI with data, with technology, and with code in general to become politicized and become like a vote bank or at least a lobby in and of themselves. And that is what I am trying to say here. So, if you want good regulation and intelligent regulation, you know, because often the caricature is the state is dumb. No, it's not. It is just selfish. So if you want it to do the things you want it to do, you have to sort of organize. That is half of the answer. The second half is that I don't think regulation is the only. Regulation is a good shield, but it's not a sword. You can use regulation to uh, sort of heal market failures, but you also need to then have radically different imaginations of AI. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. I am so sorry. So uh, again, outside. <laughs> 